Something else really big happened this week. The NFL draft took place. Anybody watch the NFL? Any NFL fans in here? Yeah, the NFL draft took place. And it was pretty cool. I was watching this, and you, you see these guys, and they're, they're sitting in this back room, and they're nervous, and they're, and they're just terrified, like, is my name going to get called? Is my name going to get called? And they're back there, and all of a sudden, they hear somebody call their name. And you just see this, this elation, this joy come over their face. And then they walk out on stage, and people are cheering, and we're all excited. And I'm at home, and I'm excited for them, and I'm like, I'm not getting a million-dollar contract. I don't know why I'm happy right now, but, but I'm happy for them. Imagine, church, what it would be like if we celebrated that way every time somebody came to Jesus. Imagine what it would be like to experience that joy and that elation that washes over their face when they encounter the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we as the body of Christ get to celebrate with them because this is a person who was just chosen. This is a person who was just adopted into the kingdom and family of God. Imagine, church, if we could have that response. And that is why we are in this message series, Go, and we are talking about following Jesus to the ends of the earth. We're talking about going to the people and taking them to plan and giving them the purpose behind this mission that we are on as a church. And there is a key verse that I've mentioned every week in this series, and it's Acts 1-8, and it says this. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, And to the end of the earth. And that's why we're talking about following Jesus to the end of the earth. And the reason I mention this verse to you guys every week is this. I want you to realize that you don't have to do this in your own power. It is the power of the Holy Spirit in you that will lead you out to be a witness for Christ. He gives you everything that you need. So if you are a child of God, you are equipped to go. You're ready to go. We are ready to do this. In week one, we answered some questions, and all of this series has been set up around these questions. And in week one, we answered some questions like, what are we supposed to go to? And we're supposed to go to the lost. We're supposed to go to them. And when are we supposed to go? We're supposed to go now. And where are we supposed to go to? To all nations. And how are we supposed to go? We're supposed to be consistent and willing, available disciples. Remember, I told you guys the story about me and my Peloton, how I would not be a good spokesperson for them right now, but I'm working on it. We're working on it. I'm on that bike every week now. We're trying to get there, right? But we are to go. We're to be ambassadors. We're to be representatives for Christ. And in week two, we answered the question, who are we supposed to go to? Who are we supposed to go to? And again, that answer, the lost. That's where we're called to go. And how do we connect with them? We have compassion and we extend grace. We be in the world, but not of the world. And we learn what Jesus taught so we can live like Jesus lived, because only then can we truly love the way that Jesus loved. Today, we're going to answer a very important question. It's every little kid's favorite question, and the question is this, why? Why do we go? Why are we supposed to go? And we say that's every little kid's favorite question. Anybody in here a parent of a little one, and you get asked why 48,000 times a day? And some of y'all are like, my kids aren't little, and they still ask me why 48,000 times a day. This is every person's favorite question. It's even our favorite question as adults, and we don't always realize that. But some of you came in here today with some why questions. Lord, why did this happen to me? Lord, why am I going through this? Lord, why has my child rebelled and run off? Lord, why did I have this illness that I I, I didn't ask for? I didn't do anything to cause this. Lord, why am I going through the things that I'm going to, going through? And we're going to answer this question, why, as it relates to people that we encounter, as it relates to the lost. And the reason I I saved why for last is because I believe that answering why, knowing your why, understanding why, makes all the other questions so much easier. If you know the why behind the what, the what gets a lot easier. If you know the, the why behind the when, the when is a lot easier. If you know the why behind the where, the where is a lot easier. For those of you that God has placed it on your call that you need to go out into the mission field and he's called you to Africa or Cambodia or Russia or wherever he's called you to, knowing the why makes that what so much easier, right? Knowing the why makes it so much easier to go home and say to your spouse, honey, we got to pack our bags, to say to your kids, babe, we got to babies, we got to pack our bags. We're going because God has given us a mission. He's given us a purpose. We know the why. So now the what, when, where, and how becomes so much more easy. And that's why we save why for last, because if you can answer the why, it makes the rest so much easier. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you guys two things today, just two points. Everybody say amen. Now, last week I made the mistake 
of saying, hey, I'm going through this kind of fast. And then I end up preaching for 50 minutes. So I, I'm not going to say that today, so don't worry. But, but I'm going to read today's main text to you. Now, this is not going to be on your screen. I'm just going to read through it for you. And then we're going to kind of break it down into two points that tell us why we need to go. And the main text for today is going to be in 2 Corinthians 5. And we're going to, it's in verse uh, 16 through 21. I'm sorry, verse 14 through 21. It says for this, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake. He made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, before we break this down, will you guys join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day, Lord. We thank you that this is the day that you've made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it, Father. We thank you that you are good and your mercy endures forever. Father, I pray that you would prepare our hearts to receive your word, that you would fill me with your spirit, that I would teach your word with clarity and that you would, would make our soil, the soil of our heart, good and fertile soil and produce fruit for your kingdom. And we thank you. We praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. All right. So one last reminder before we break this down again. I want you guys to know that my heart, my desire, my purpose in this series is not to beat you up. I want you guys to leave here saying, I can do that. I can go and make disciples in my context and in my world. I don't want you to leave here feeling beat up and like you're less than or anything like that. I really want us all to leave here excited about this challenge that God has given us and ready to dive into it because we're called to this. And through the Holy Spirit, you and I can do all that God has called us to do. Are you all ready to dive in? Yeah. All right. Caleb's ready to dive in. Anybody else ready to dive in? Let me hear you. Come on now. All right. Woo! Let's dive in. Why are we supposed to go to the lost? The first thing is this. This is our mission. This is our mission. Let's jump back into 2 Corinthians 5.14. It says, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that what? Those who live might no longer live for themselves. Your life is not your own. You have been bought with a price. And when Christ died for you, he died that you might no longer live for yourself, pursuing your, your flesh, pursuing your desires, but that you might pursue his kingdom. And a part of pursuing his kingdom is the decision that I'm going to obey him. I'm going to go. I'm going to go out into the world, and I'm going to make disciples. Church, this is our mission. He goes on to say in verse 16 that from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Now, what do you think he means we regard no one according to the flesh? That's a weird sounding statement, right? And as I, was, as I was going through this kind of prepping for this, I'm like, all right, God, I need you to give me some clarity on this statement because you're talking about we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we regarded Christ that way at one point. And this is the Apostle Paul talking, and I'm like, what does this even mean? And so let me tell you what this kind of means. This means that we no longer look at the outside. We no longer look at what's on the surface. Like we're not judging people based on how they appear to us in the moment because what he's really saying here and the reason he talks about Christ is at one point everybody looked at Christ based on the fact of where he was from. He's from Nazareth. He's, he's a carpenter's son. He can't be anything. He can't be a great teacher. And they regarded him thus. And if you think about the person who's saying this, the apostle Paul, before Paul was the apostle Paul, he was Saul the Pharisee. He was a religious leader in Israel. He was a teacher of the law. He was one who was persecuting Christians because he thought Christians were leading people astray. So Paul is admitting to you that at one point I looked at Christ like this man is a lunatic. He's saying at one point I looked at Christ like this cannot be the son of God. He's saying at one point I looked at Christ like he was a false 
prophet. I judged him based on his flesh. I looked at who he was, his status in life, the fact that he was a low-class person in society. This man was born in a manger. He was the son of a carpenter. He did not have great status. He was not a Pharisee. He was not a religious leader. He was not a politician. And Paul is saying, at one point in my life, I did not think Jesus could possibly be the Messiah because he didn't come in the way a king comes in. He came in like a lowly person, and we regarded Christ according to the flesh. And then Paul twists that, or he turns that to say to us that we should no longer look at people that way. So what Paul is saying to you and me is, when we go out into the world, we're not supposed to look at the homeless person and say, you're less than me because you're homeless. He's saying we're not supposed to look at the drug addict and say, there's no hope for you because you're addicted to drugs. He's saying we're not supposed to look at the prostitute and say, and immediately assume you're on your way to hell because you're in prostitution. He's saying we don't regard people according to the flesh because no matter where they are in the flesh, Christ has a greater purpose for them. No matter where they are in the flesh, Christ can redeem them. He can make them brand new. And so Paul is telling us here that, hey, don't regard people according to the flesh. Now, we're all guilty of this. We've all done it. I've done it way more than I would like to admit to you that I've done this. But we look at people and we make assumptions. We do. We just do. It's human nature. What do we call that? Stereotyping? We all do it. We like to say that we don't. We like to say we don't have those biases and and things like that. But on some level, we all do it. I remember being a teenager in Texas. I lived in a little town in Texas called Friendswood. Friendswood, Texas. And I remember 14 years old walking to the basketball court and just dribbling my basketball down the street and hearing people lock their car doors as I walked by. And I'm like, man, if these people knew me, they would know that I'm probably the the sweetest person you'll ever meet. I know it don't always look that way. I look grumpy half the time, but I'm a big softy. I'm a big teddy bear. It's just who I am, right? But these people made an assumption based on what they saw. We make those assumptions. I walk down the street. I see a, a six foot six big 300-pound white dude with a bald head and tattoos everywhere, I make some assumptions. This is what we do, right? It is what we do. Is that right, though? No. We shouldn't make those assumptions. And I, told, I shared this story that, like, in my life in Texas, a lot of the people who helped me, who ministered to me, a lot of the men who became fathers to me, this fatherless kid, were people that you would never expect. Two guys in particular, Jim McKimmy and, and Ron Gandy, and I hope you guys are watching. If you are, thank you so much uh, for all that that you did for me. But these two guys, if you saw them, think quintessential Texan. Jim McKimmy, 6'5", 300 pounds, big cowboy hat. This is Jim. Ron Gandy was that guy I just described on the, with the, t- the bald head and the tattoos everywhere, right? And these were guys that at first assumption that had I looked at them and regarded them according to the flesh, I never would have had an opportunity to learn from them and grow and, and feel the love of Christ through these men because I would have been judging them based on an outward appearance. But when we operate in Christ, when we operate through the Holy Spirit, he tears all that down. And so you can see what God is trying to do in a person that no matter what they look like on the outside, you can tell that this is a person that Christ wants to reach. That's why it's so important that we go through this in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because if we go do this in our power, what kicks in? Our assumptions, our biases, our stereotypes, all of that stuff that would say to us, that person's unreachable because of who they are and what they're doing today. But Christ would say, no, I died for everybody. I came into the world not to condemn the world, but the world through, through me might be saved. And we miss the opportunity to participate in what God is doing when we get so focused on regarding people according to the flesh. And I would challenge you in this moment right now, who are those people that, that just kind of, uh, they don't sit right with you. Who are those people that you definitely always regard according to the flesh? Who are those people that you need to say, God, break this down in me right now. Renew my heart. Give me a clean mind because I view this person in a way that you don't. Change my heart and my perception of them. Who is that person? Who is that group of people that you need to have that conversation with yourself and with God about in this moment? Paul said, we regard no one according to the flesh. Because here's the bottom line in that. This is our mission. And if we go out and we regard people according to the flesh, we're not going to fulfill our mission. If we think back to week one, we looked at Matthew 28, 19, and 20, the Great Commission, where it said, go therefore and make disciples 
of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. This is our mission to, as we are going, as we're going to school, young people, as we're going to work, old people like me, as we are going about our daily life to the gym and the coffee shop, no matter where we're going, we are to be focused on making disciples. And everyone that you run into has the potential to be a disciple in Christ no matter where they are today because guess what? All of us were in a place one day where we did not need to be. Every single one of us at one point in our life was somewhere we did not need to be. And some of our stories are, are far, they seem far bigger than others. For some of us, Christ found us with a drug needle in our arm. For some of us, Christ found us in the midst of jail or prison or no matter what else was going on in our life. At some point, Christ found us in that situation. But some of us walk around like we might be a little bit better than because I never did all of that. But guess what? No matter what you were doing. You were deserving of death and hell until Jesus paid the price for you on the cross and gave you victory through his resurrection. And it's that resurrection victory that we take out to the world so that when we see that person with the needle hanging out of their arm, we say, you know what? You might be in a bad place right now, but I know a Jesus who can redeem you and restore you and clean you up. And you can be standing up here next to me a few years from now preaching the gospel and guiding people to life in Christ because that's what our Jesus does. He redeems and he restores and he sets captives free. This is the God that we serve. And he gave us this mission to go and to take this to the world behind us. And he didn't just leave it there. He left us some encouragement at the end of verse 20 when he said, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is our mission. And some of you may be like, man, Jay, that sounds kind of weird. That sounds kind of like military-ish, battlefield-ish, all that kind of stuff. I don't really think in terms of mission that way. Where are my parents at? Parents in the room, raise your hands. Y'all be excited. Some of y'all are like, I don't want to put my hand up because I don't like my kids right now. <laughs> parents, guess what? <laughs> You're on a mission. And you have been on a mission ever since that little life came into the world. You're on a mission to guide that child to Christ. You are on a mission to make sure they are protected and provided for and nurtured and given the things that they need so that they can grow and they can flourish. You have been on a mission. You understand this mission thing better than you think. You understand what it means to take someone, and we could use this metaphorically. You have this little baby. You don't just send them out on their own. You don't be like, hey, bud, you spent nine and a half months in here. Not me, my wife. You know, you spent nine and a half months in here. You're out. You're on your own, buddy. Go ahead. Run with it. We don't do that. Do we? Why? They would die. They wouldn't make it on their own. They can't even hold their head up when they're born, right? What do we do? We walk alongside them, and we train them, and we nourish, nurture them, and we, we build them up to a point where they are able to go out on their own. That's what our faith is like. When we go out and we reach people for Christ, when they come in and they're spiritual babies, we walk alongside them so that they don't fall back into the traps of sin and all that stuff. We nourish them and nurture them, and we, we help build them up to a point where they are ready to go make disciples on their own. This is our mission. Parents, you understand that. Students, where are my students at? Where are my students? Hey, how y'all doing this morning? I am so glad that we get to spend Sunday morning with you guys. It, it actually makes me happy to know that you're in here and that you get to hear God's word with us and that you're participating in the service because this is your church. This is your church. This isn't your parents' church. This is your church, and I want you to know that. But you guys are on a mission, too. Whether your mission is, I'm going to be the best-looking dude in high school and pull all the honeys. Do y'all say honeys anymore? Is that, am I showing my age? The 1990s? Is that? Woo! Come on, somebody. Help me out. Y'all are on a mission. Some of y'all, that mission is sports. Like, I'm going to train my body. I'm going to eat right. And some of y'all are really disciplined, and you're doing really great things because you're on a mission to get somewhere. See, we understand this word mission more than we think. We just don't always use it in everyday life. But this is our mission as individual believers and our mission as a church. You have been commissioned by the God of the universe to go and make disciples. That's your mission. And so, student, the same way you train for your sport, you train spiritually. You stay in God's word. You stay in prayer. You get built up. You get spiritually strong so that you can go, so that you can go. The same is true for our little kids. That's why we send them to city kids so that they can learn about God. They can hear his word so that they can get built up because at some point in their life, they're going to have to go too. And some of your kids are really good about going now. Some of y'all have been put in situations where your kids have invited people to your house and to your church and all types of stuff because your kid is ready to go before you are. Real talk, right? Because they, they have a friend. 
And they see their friend, and they're like, hey, I know Jesus. I love Jesus. I want my friend to love Jesus, too. So they go to Billy, and they're like, hey, Billy, come on to church with me. And Billy goes home, and Billy tells his parents, hey, Pete invited me to church. I want to go to church with Pete. And before you know it, now you're setting up play dates and dinner dates and invites and all types of stuff because your kids started that process. And that's okay. That works well, right? And we should pour into them and pour into that and encourage them when they do that. Don't shoot them down when they do that. If your kid comes home and says, hey, I got a friend that I've been talking to about Jesus, do everything you can to make sure that kid gets what they need to to lead their friend to Christ. Be a part of that mission because God has, has put in the heart of your child that you can go to. You don't have to be 35 to go. You can be five and you can still go. And we should encourage that in our kids because this is our mission. All of us have access to different people in different places and spaces that we can guide to life in Christ if we commit to this mission. So number one, the reason why we go to the lost, number one, this is our mission. Reason number two is this, we are God's method. And I know y'all have heard me say that every week. We even got a quote attached to it, guys, but we are God's method. If we jump back into 2 Corinthians 5, 17, excuse me, it says, therefore, now, what is he saying, therefore, about? That therefore points back to verse 16, where it says that he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves. So we, because Jesus died for all and we are now wrapped up in him, therefore, in Christ, we are a new creation. Now, some of y'all are like, I hear this verse all the time, but I don't feel very new. I still struggle with a lot of the things that I struggled with. I still face a lot of the things that I faced. I don't feel very new. Well, you are being made new, and at some point, we are going to be with Jesus, and we're going to be glorified with him, and you're going to be totally new. No more sin, no more shame, no more guilt, no more bondage, no more none of that stuff. But until that happens, we are still in sinful flesh, but we are being made new, conformed to the image of Christ. We're being conformed to his image. And that is why even though now, even though he hasn't come back and brought us home with him yet, in Christ, we are still a new creation. You're being made new. You're being renewed from the inside out. The Holy Spirit of God, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, is living inside of you. He's making you new, making you alive, quickening, the word says, quickening, making alive your mortal body. He's making you new. And you should walk in that newness of life because it says the old has passed away behold the new has come all this is from God and it's important to remember that that all of this comes from God it's not about you it's not that you earned it or deserved it in any way this all comes from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself now that word word reconcile really just means to restore to friendly relationship or to cause to coexist in harmony and that points back to the message Pastor Brian preached on Easter. Y'all like, Pastor Jay, why are you sweating all the time? I'm a black preacher is what we do. <laughs> that points back to the message Pastor Brian preached on Easter. We talked about these two graves and these two gardens, right? And that we were in the garden. Adam and Eve were in the garden with God. And Scripture says that they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, which means that they were used to being in community with the Father. They were used to walking with him. They knew that sound. And so when this talks about Christ reconciling us to God, what it's talking about is how that was broken in the garden, how we lost that relationship. We lost that harmony with God. We were no longer able to commune with him. But through Christ, God was reconciling us to himself, that he was bringing us back to himself, that through that second garden where Jesus prayed over us and in that second grave where Jesus was buried for us, that he ultimately rose from victoriously, Through that second part, we have been reconciled to God and Christ. We've been restored to relationship with him. We've been made to be back in harmony with him, right? He's reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, verse 19. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. He was not counting their trespasses against them. So this points back to that whole no longer regarding anyone according to the flesh, because what we understand is, although you may be full of trespasses right now, once you are reconciled to God and Christ, those trespasses are no longer counted against you. So we no longer regard you according to where you are today, but we regard you according to where Christ can bring you to. We look at you, we see the potential in you, we see the Holy Spirit's power in you and what he's working out in your life. And I want to take a moment and just encourage some of you. Some of you, especially some of us who are are a little bit older as parents, we have some kids who have walked away from God and maybe even have walked away from our families. Don't lose hope. 
don't give up hope. As long as there is breath in their body, God can reconcile them through Christ. There is hope there. Don't you dare lose hope. Keep praying for that child. Keep being available for that child. Keep being willing and consistent for that child because God has promised us that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He's going to be with us. And God will give you opportunity to minister to that child. Now, what ultimately happens with them is between them and the father. But don't you dare lose hope. Don't you dare lose hope. Keep pursuing that child the way that Christ pursues you. Keep being available for them so that when they call, just make sure you're consistent. Make sure they know that they are loved. Make sure they know that they are cared for. Make sure they know that there is a God who loves them. And hear me clearly on this. Loving them is not condoning what they're doing. There's a difference there. You don't have to condone what they do to love them. We're not commanded to condone anything that they do. In fact, it's the opposite. But I can still very much love you and tell you that I don't agree with you. And that's okay. And we have to be willing to take that stand. That's where consistency comes into play. And I get it. I have kids of my own. We have Rashida and I have kids who are not walking with the Lord today. And there's always a little bit of temptation there. There's always a little bit of temptation to say, I want my child back so badly. Let me just overlook what's happening. We can't do that. We can't condone what they're doing. But we can always be open and willing and available to love them with the love of Jesus. Because think about how Jesus handled these situations. Think about what Jesus did when he encountered someone who was trapped in sin. Jesus never condoned the sin, but Jesus always loved the sinner. Jesus always loved the sinner. He said, where are those who convict you? Where are those who accuse you? And when those people had left, Jesus said, neither do I um, accuse you. But he did say, go and sin no more. There was always this thing with Jesus where I'm going to love you in spite of what you're doing in the hope that you're going to then turn and follow me, and you're not going to live that lifestyle anymore. But for most of us, we never get to the point where they can turn and follow Jesus because we get so focused on the sin that we throw the sinner out with the sin. All right? And as parents, we have to be very careful with that. Again, I understand there's some things you can't allow in your house. I understand that the standard, the, the thing that we live by, means that there's certain things we have to put our foot down about. But putting your foot down is not an unloving thing. All right? You need to love your child through that. And sometimes the best way to love your child, and we see this borne out in Scripture, and you may not like this statement, but sometimes the best way to learn your, love your child is to turn them over to whatever thing they're pursuing so that they can hit rock bottom and cry out to Jesus for themselves. That's what happened to me. My mom had to eventually throw her hands up and be like, "What well, everything you're doing, you can't do in my house. I love you, and I'm sorry, but I got to let you go to this. And it was when I hit rock bottom that I was like, I need Jesus for myself. And I fully believe personally, and this may, I mean, you have to assess your situation the way it is, but I fully believe personally that God was able to reach me a lot quicker because my mom allowed that to happen. She allowed me to go through that process. She didn't try to intervene and rescue me from it every five seconds. She allowed it to happen, so I hit rock bottom a little bit faster. And God was like, you don't like it down there, do you? I was like, no. All right, then, come on. (laughs) You know, sometimes we have to let that happen. And I get it. As parents, that hurts. There's nothing harder, and I'm going to move on after this. And I know sometimes I, we have a lot of families with young babies in our church, and, and sometimes I just, you know, I'm like, hey, your baby's so cute. And they're like, that's because you didn't have to stay up with them at 2 a.m. last night. And I don't want to discourage you young parents, but, man, there's seriously nothing harder than, than having an adult child, bro. Whew. Oh, my goodness. Because they have the freedom to do whatever they want, and you just kind of have to sit back and watch it happen. And that's hard. It's hard. And so, parents, I'm just, I'm saying this more so to encourage you. Don't lose hope. Keep loving your child. Keep praying. Keep pursuing that child. Keep being willing and available for them. You don't have to condone what they do, but you can still love them through everything that's happening. All right? All right, let's move forward. God has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. Verse 20, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now, what does it mean that God's making his appeal through us? What's more appealing to other people than a transformed life? What's more appealing, and again, going back to the workout analogy, what's more appealing to a person who's out of shape than to see someone who was just as out of shape as them now transform, now turn around, now, oh, you did this, so I I think I can go down that road too. Can you walk down that road with me? God is making his appeal through you by transforming your life. You are a walking billboard for Christ. 
whether you realize it or not. And that is why it's so important, going back to week one, that we be consistent and willing and available because we are a walking billboard for Christ. Everything in your life should shout out to the world around you, I belong to Jesus. And if there's something in your life that doesn't shout to the world around you, I belong to Jesus, it probably doesn't need to be in your life. If there's something in your life that makes people question whether you belong to Jesus, probably doesn't need to be in your life. If there's something in your life that makes you question whether you belong to Jesus, it definitely doesn't need to be in your life. All right? So we are, God is making his appeal through us. We are a walking billboard for Jesus. Don't lose sight of that. God is going to put you in some situations and some circumstances where you have an opportunity to glorify him through your life. I remember working at a staffing company back in 2010. It was a staffing company that, that did staffing for the local shipyards. And in 2010, there was this big earthquake in Haiti. And when the earthquake happened, the Navy took all these vessels that were supposed to come here to be worked on and was like, we got to redirect them to Haiti to help out with this humanitarian relief. And so when that happened, all the people that were supposed to be working in the shipyard at that time got told, hey, sorry, the boats aren't coming. We're going to lay some of y'all off. But what does that mean for the person that's staffing for them? <laughs> you don't have a job, right? And so I remember going to work one day, and my boss calls. She, they were calling us in the room one by one. And everybody's coming out, and they're mad, and they're cussing. They're hot, bro. They're like, I can't believe this. I done gave my life to this, and blah, 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 and all this stuff. And it was my turn to get called into the room. And now when four people get called in before you, you kind of know what's coming, right? You kind of know what's about to happen to you. And so my boss comes out. She's like, Jay, I need to see you. I'm like, okay. Like, you know, walk in. I'm like, all right, what's going on? And my boss and I were close. We had been friends for years. And she, got, she starts crying. And she's like, I'm like, why are you crying? You're not getting laid off. I'm getting laid off. Like, what are you crying about? But She's like, I'm so sorry, but I, I have to lay you off. We just, we just can't have you here. And I looked her in her face, and I said to her, I said, you know what? It's okay. God has a plan and a purpose, and he's in control. And I believe that God's in control, and I, I believe that God has me. And so I'm not worried. You don't need to worry. I'm going to be okay. We're going to be okay. And then she wiped her tears away, and she's like, thank you so much for that, because you, the previous four meetings didn't go that way, right? <laughs> it was like all types of stuff. Can't stay in church, but... And so then I walk back out, and other people are in the office, and they're staring at me. And they're like, how could you respond that way? And I'm like, I truly believe God has me. Now I realize that was day one. It was easy to believe that, and I still believe God has me. But like a month later when I still didn't have a job, I was like, God, do you got me? Like, <laughs> I told all those people, you got me, and I'm not feeling like you got me right now, God. Like, what's going on? And God came through. That's actually the start of the story of how I ended up in ministry. But that's a, I'll say that for a different message. But, but God came through. God had a purpose in that. And I think back to that situation. I had spent almost a year at that company with people knowing that I was a Christian. I had been a walking billboard for Jesus. I was very open about my faith in that place. And God used that situation to allow me to show people you can rely on him. You can have faith and trust in him. Like, you don't have to respond to things the way that everybody responds to things. You can have faith and you can have trust. And so I, I share that story just to say to you all, how do we operate at work? Does your work life demonstrate that you rely on the king of the universe? Or does your work life demonstrate that this is all about you? And I would just challenge you with that a little bit. God is making his appeal through you because we are God's method. And then the last verse in this, this chapter that we're going to cover is what I actually will call the big why behind all of this. It's the big why. Why do we go to do this? And it's verse 21. And it says, for our sake, this is how it starts. For our sake, if we can go to the next slide, please. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I want you to think about that first statement, for our sake, for our sake. And I know a lot of times when we talk about, when we talk about God and our relationship with him, we tend to look at it from the perspective of almost like God did this for himself. He wanted a relationship with us, so he redeemed us. Like he wanted his glory, so he redeemed us. But it says for our sake, for your sake. God 
made him who knew no sin to be sin for your sake and for my sake. And this is one of those times where I like to put my, I like to take that word our out and put my name there. For Jay's sake, God, the Father, made Jesus the Son who knew no sin. He made him to be sin for me. I don't deserve that. I'm so undeserving of that. And he did it so that I might, so that Jay might become the righteousness of God. And I share that with you to say that this is the big why. This is why we go. Because for your sake, God the Father made Jesus the Son who knew no sin. He made him to be sin so that you might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He did that for your sake so that you could be redeemed and restored, so that you could be set free from the bondage of sin in your life. He did that for your sake. He loved you so much that he sent his son into the world to redeem you, not to condemn you. He did that for your sake. That's our big why. Because we are God's method. He did that for us. We are a walking billboard for him. And I know in this series, I've used this quote every week now, and it's this, that man is looking for better methods, but God is looking for better men because man is God's method. And I just really want you guys to understand that. I want you to grab a hold of that idea that we are God's method. We're the, we're the ones that he wants to use to bring about his mission and his purpose on the earth. Now, you may be wondering, all right, Pastor Jay, I get it. I realize this is my mission. This is my mission I have to take up as a child of God. And I realize that I am God's method, that he wants to use me as a tool to to reach the lost, to reach the world around me. But what is this process supposed to look like? What is this going to look like? And I'm glad you asked. This process for us, and I'm going to give you just kind of a quick breakdown of what this is supposed to look like. And so as you start off, let's say you connect with someone and they begin to engage with you. They begin to be a part of your life. We go back to week one and we invite this person into our home. They come and they sit at our dinner table. They have their family has den- dinner with our family and we spend time together and they begin to see what life in Christ looks like in you and what they see leads to a change of mind. What they see leads to a change of mind. They don't go through life anymore thinking, man, Christians are weird or, or Christians are phony or Christians are haters or, Christian or Christians are all this because they experience the love of Christ in you. That leads to a change of mind in them. They have a change of mind. And that change of mind looks a little bit different. They may start asking you questions. They may start like, hey, what does this mean? Or or why did you look at this thing that way? Or or why did you respond to that situation that way? And some of us, the best thing that we can do is invite people into the things that we're trying to hide. Some of us are facing situations in our homes and in our families that we hope and pray that nobody finds out about. But the lost people around you, that may be the very thing that God uses to draw them to himself. If you're willing to share it, if you're willing to allow God to work on it in you and willing to share it with other people who are facing similar situations, that may lead to a change of mind. And then that change of mind will ultimately lead to a change of heart. That change of heart comes because that person, once their mind is changed, now the Holy Spirit is working on them and he's drawing them to Christ and he's giving them faith to believe. And then they, they see your life and they say, now I believe. And because I believe, the Holy Spirit is now inside of me. He's making me alive. He's sanctifying me. And that word just means that he's setting me apart or making me new. He's removing the things in me that don't look like Christ and replacing them with the things that do look like Christ. That's when that change of heart comes into play. And then that change of heart then leads to a changed life. And this is when they become a walking billboard for Christ themselves, that God is making an appeal through them, that he has changed their life to the point now where the other lost people around them will see them and say, hey, I know you used to do this and I know you used to do that, but your life has changed now. You've been made new. Why are you living differently now? Because then they can say, I have been reconciled to God in Christ. And that's the ultimate goal is for people to be reconciled to God in Christ. That we've been given this message of reconciliation that God has been reconciling us to himself through the Son. They can be reconciled to God in Christ. So how do we get there? How do we get there? The first thing that we got to do is pray and go. We pray and we go. Look back at Matthew 9, 37, and this was... From last week's message, it says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We pray. We always pray first, and we pray earnestly. Lord of the harvest, 
Send out laborers into your harvest. But then we realize that we are the laborers, that we need to go, that we need to allow him to use us to go to the world around us. We pray and then we go. And so when we started this series, I told you guys that every week I was going to give you a family challenge. Every week that I was going to challenge you as a family to do something uh, with the messages that you were hearing. And so week one's challenge was to talk about what it looks like for you to go or looks like for you to make disciples as you're going. What is your family's sphere of influence? And we talked about how, for some of you, the best place for you to make disciples is on the sports field, because that's the one place that you all meet at, right? Mom and dad are there, all the kids are there, and there's probably some families that are at that sports field with you that don't know Jesus, that you can start to build a relationship with, that you can start to to do stuff with. Hey, how about we all bring snacks for one another next week? Hey, how about we just, how, how about you come to my house and have dinner with us as a family? How about we do some things together? And God can use those opportunities for you to guide people to life in Christ. So that was kind of week one. And then last week, we talked about how our kids are learning about putting others first and our students are learning about culture versus God's word. And so your challenge was to have some real talks to prepare your hearts for this week, to have some real talks, to pray and seek forgiveness and submit to God's plan for your life, submit to this mission. And so here's your challenge for this week, week three. Who is the person or family that you can invite into your home and into your life? And I made this statement in week one that Pastor Brian and I don't want you guys to invite anybody into this church that you haven't first invited into your home or into your life. And I mean that. And what, but what I mean by that is this. Don't let this be the first stop on that journey. Build a relationship with people. Take somebody out to lunch. Invite them into your home for dinner. Start building that relationship first because If my first thing to you is if I've never talked to you before and I come up to you at work and I'm like, hey, bud, here's an invite card to my church service this week. Come to church. That's kind of a hollow invitation. Like there's no investment there. And I even shared how I used to be the church ninja. Like I'd wait till everybody went to lunch and start throwing invite cards on people's desk and didn't feel good about myself because I'm like, hey, I invited 30 people this week. No, I didn't. I just wasted some paper. Right. Be that person who's willing to invest in people. Discipleship is a journey. It's a process. Have some people in your life that you're willing to invest in. And so your challenge is to identify that person or family and make contact. Make contact with them. Don't be creepy. Don't be like, hey, my pastor said I need to talk to people, so uh, you want to go to lunch? Don't, yeah, don't do that. That's going to be weird. They're probably going to say no. It's going to be creepy. Don't do that. That's why you need to be authentic. And that's why this happens much easier when it's people that we have a natural relationship with, like the sporting event or like a coworker or somewhere where there's already a common bond, a common, common interest that you can use to be authentic and start building these relationships. And then remember this, this last part up here, and I put this up here on purpose. Nobody wants to be a project. I put that up there for two reasons. Number one, I want you to think about it from that person's perspective. But number two, I also want you to guard your heart and your mind in this. Because it's very easy for us to look at someone and say, they need to be fixed, let me fix them. And that's not our place. We're supposed to guide people to life in Christ. But the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts them. That's not our job. The Holy Spirit is the one that gives them faith to believe. That's not our job. Jesus, the blood of Jesus is is what redeems them. That's not our job. Our job is to be willing and present and consistent and available, to be authentic in their life. Don't go out looking for projects to fix. But pray, as you pray, ask God, Lord, show me who you want me to just be available to. Show me who you want me to start investing in to build a relationship with so that I can point them to you, Jesus. God, show me. And some of you may be like, Pastor Jay, I want to do this, but I don't have the resources. Like, I don't have money to buy extra food for people to invite them for dinner. Like, I, I get it. I spent $72 at the grocery store the other day just to make tacos, I think. It was, it was something crazy. Like, I get it. Food is high right now. All that stuff is high. But I don't want you to miss what God is doing in your life. So if that is your situation, if you're like, we just don't have the resources for this, I want you to email me. And my email is up on the screen. I want you to email me. And (laughs) because I really don't want you to miss what God wants to do in you and through you. And if that means that Seven Cities Church needs to cut you a check for a few hundred bucks to buy some groceries so that you can bring a family in your house, that's what we'll do. If that means that Pastor Jay needs to go to Starbucks and get you a gift card for you to take your coworker to coffee, I'll do it. 
Whatever it takes, we're going to do it, no matter what, because our mission is to go, and we are God's method. And church, we're not, a, we're not in, the, in this business to get big as a church, but we are in this business to grow the kingdom of God. And the only way we are going to grow God's kingdom is to do our part, and that part is for us to go. You can take me off the screen now. We have to pray and go. we got to pray and go. And some of you may be like, Pastor Jay, I'm actually good with the, the going part. It's the prayer part that I struggle with. I don't know what to pray. And I'm going to read this prayer to you from this book. This book is called Prayers That Avail Much. Uh, and I think it was Miss Starr recommended this book to me. And we gave some to our, our prayer team here at the church. But this book is literally, it's like 150, 160 prayers just over different situations. So if you're like, I don't know what to pray, you can grab a book and you can just say, all right, this prayer is salvation for the lost. And this is what it says. It says, and this is from the perspective of a group praying, but it says, we come to stand in the gap before you and pray for those who are lost and without God. We pray in agreement with Jesus who is able to save to the uttermost those who come to you through him because he always lived to make intercession for them. We pray for those who are perishing, for their minds are blinded by the God of this age, leaving them in unbelief. Open their blind eyes that keep them from seeing the day spring light of the wonderful news of the glory of Jesus Christ. Father, let your brilliant light shine out of darkness and cascade your light into them that they might see the knowledge of grace and truth. We are here to take our stand against the unseen spirits of darkness that have held them in bondage. We pray for their deliverance from the power of darkness and ask you to convey them into the kingdom of the son of your love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Father, we know that Satan would prevent these people from hearing truth if possible. We are human, but we don't wage war with human plans and methods. We use God's mighty weapons to knock down the devil's strongholds. With these weapons, we break down every proud argument that keeps people from confessing Jesus as Lord and believing in their hearts that you raised them from the dead. We pray that people will be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. When the light shines out of darkness and they hear the good news of the gospel, they will call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Thank you for loving us even when we were your enemies. You gave us your son, your one and only son, so that no one need be destroyed by believing in him. Anyone can have a whole and lasting life. Jesus, you are not late with your promise to return. The, daily, the delay reveals your loving patience <clears throat> towards those who do not yet know you because you do not want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Lord Jesus, when we look at the nations, we realize that the harvest of souls is huge and ripe. We ask the owner of the harvest to thrust out many more reapers, many more laborers to harvest his grain. We confess that they shall see who have never been told of Jesus. They shall understand who have never heard of Jesus. And they shall come out of the snare of the devil who has held them captive. They shall open their eyes and turn from darkness to light from the power of Satan to you. God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you're that person and you're like, man, I don't know what to pray. I actually have two more copies of this book that I would love to give away. If you just see me in the lobby after church, I would love to give them to you because I want to help you pray. I want to help you pray and I want to help you grow. We want to do that as a church. We want to make sure that you are equipped to go out and do what God is calling you to do. And as a part of that equipping, we're going to kick off a new series next week called At the Table. Pastor Brian's going to kick this series off, and we're going to talk about what life looks like around the table. You know, there was a time in our country where like 5.30 every day, families gathered around the table, and that's where conversation took place. That's where, where brokenness was healed. That's where bonding happened. All of this stuff happened around the table, but it seems like for the most part, we've lost that. And so we want to talk about getting back around the table, you and your family, but also you and those people that you go to. We want to talk about getting back around the table and allowing God to use that time, that space in our life to guide your family to life in him, but also to guide others to life in him. So my prayer is that you guys would come back next week as Pastor Brian kicks that series off. And we'll just move forward as a church with this mission, realizing that our mission is to go and that we are God's method. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this day, Lord. We thank you for the blood of your son, Jesus, the blood that he shed so that we might have life in you. Thank you for reconciling us 
to yourself through him and making your appeal through us to the world around us so that as we cry out, Lord, why do we go? We go because for our sake, you made him who knew no sin to be sin, that we might become the righteousness of God through him. You did that for us, Jesus. Now help us take that message of reconciliation, that message that says you no longer count our trespasses against us, that message that says that you came into the world to redeem the world, to heal the world, to forgive the world, to save the world, not to condemn us, that message that says that you so loved the world that you sent your only son, that message that says that you loved us so much that while we were still sinners, while we were in the midst of our sin and our guilt and our shame, while we were at the lowest place, totally undeserving of you, Christ died for us. And through his death and resurrection, Lord, we have victory in you. Help us take that message to the lost and the broken and the hurting, to the destitute, to those who have no hope, Lord. Help us take this message of hope to them. Give us eyes, Lord, I pray, to see people the way that you see them and to love people the way that you love them and to be the hands and feet of Jesus to the world around us. And we will praise you for it. And Jesus, it's in your precious name we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. amen.